Hello folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. You know, it's the job of the Watchman. According to Ezekiel 33, I just kind of moved my way over there. It's the job of the Watchman to stand and watch. And when I see the sword coming, it's my job or whoever else God sets up as a watchman to warn people when the sword comes. Now there's different types of swords mentioned in the Bible, but one in particular that we're going to deal with today is the sword it has to do with the sword of false doctrine, the sword of false religions, and false religious practices. You say, where do you get that from? Well, in the book of Proverbs, Solomon described the strange woman. And remember, in Proverbs, there's two women in there. One of them is wisdom. And, of course, she is the wisdom of God that comes from the Word of God. Um, but then there's the strange woman. She is a whore. So that makes her Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. The book of Proverbs describes her as her mouth, meaning the words that she speaks, sharp as a two-edged sword. Sound familiar? Because Paul said that the word of God is, he didn't say it was a sharp two-edged sword. He said it was sharper than any two-edged sword sword. In other words, this Bible trumps your mind, my mind, your mouth, my mouth, anybody's mouth, anybody's sayings, anybody's wisdom, anybody's doctrine, anybody's religion, and so on and so on and so on. So it's my job, or any watchman's job, to warn when that sword, not wait until after the sword has come, but to warn people before the harm is done, before the sword comes. It's our responsibility. So here lately, I've been noticing, you know, I, I've been studying, and I've made this known, I've been studying in the Bible, spirits, different types of evil spirits, not not necessarily the good angels yet, I'll get to that, but the evil spirits, the unclean spirits, familiar spirits, devils, uh, principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. I've been studying those things in the Bible, and lo and behold, I start seeing things show up. You know, Friday, I take my wife out. It's Sweetie Pie Day. So it's her day and she gets to go wherever she wants and shop wherever she wants. And usually we go to the same places every day, every Friday. And um, so I started noticing some, uh, I've got some magazines over here hidden. <clears throat> I don't want you to tell anybody about them. This one uh, came out no, a few weeks ago and it's called The Story of Witches. Now, this is not written by uh, a right-wing fundamentalist gospel preacher like me. Uh, it's actually written to give a history of witchcraft and to tell you how good it is. And boo on the Salem witch trials. They were evil and bad. And you all know, listen. Then, we're not done. Then, recently, see this one, because I'm going to start looking into the idea of ghosts, poltergeists, spirit activity. Do houses, can houses really become haunted? Are there spirits that show up on photographs, film, video? everybody's carrying a camera now. People are, have YouTube channels where they go in to old buildings, especially in the middle of the night, and lo and behold, there's always some creature there, some shadow or something like that. And this one's ghost hunting. 
The Secrets of the Supernatural, Investigating the Paranormal, The World's Spookiest True Tales, How to Talk to Ghosts. I don't, I don't think you want to do that. But anyway, another Let's Do This and Have Fun magazine. Okay? This one is where we're going today. This pretty much covers all of that. It's called The History of Paganism, and you notice the symbol right away of the star, the pentagram, the five-pointed star that virtually everybody on the planet knows that it represents Lucifer, how art thou fallen, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Five. I will be like the most high. So, remember what I said earlier about the mouth of the strange woman and her words are a sharp two-edged sword. That's what this is. Because it cuts into people's thinking. And it gets them to rethink what they actually believe. And now we live in a world, I mean, if you haven't noticed, the History Channel, Discovery Channel, the Learning Channel, every channel, just about on cable or satellite, has some form of paranormal, ghost hunting, supernatural, UFO, all this stuff, it's like it's taken over everything. What it's doing is it's popularizing these ideas. What, what it's actually doing, uh, we find in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we find it rather quickly, we hope. Verse 11, and for this God, cause God shall send them strong delusion. That's what all of this represents a strong delusion, that they should believe a lie. Why? That they all might be damned who believe not the truth. So God wants us to use his word to destroy, to destroy and tear down the false religions. Not in, not in some real form like we go shoot people who don't believe what we believe. But we are right alongside of these people in the marketplace of ideas and I'm going to give, and others like me are going to give out the Word of God, show them what the Bible says. They can then look at this, and they can look at everything else they want to. They have freedom of choice, free will, and then they can decide what they want to do. And that's what I want to do today. I'm going to give you the history, <clears throat> and we're going to actually read a page out of here. Um, we'll turn right to it. Look at there. Of a religious holiday that billions of people, maybe millions of people, all over the country celebrate every year. And I'm not talking about Christmas. I'm not talking about Fourth of July. I'm talking about Samhain. You say, I've never heard of that. I, I, I don't do that. Yeah, I never heard of that. Uh, actually, it, it looks like the word Sam Hain. Okay? We used to have a neighbor. His name was Sam Hain. Hey, Mr. Hain. Um, no, it's actually a, it's a Gaelic word, um, and it's pronounced Samhain. And let me read to you just <clears throat> a little bit out of this, and we'll try to put it up on the screen for you. Samhain falls on October 31st. It's the last of three harvest festivals for pagans. You're not a pagan, are you? I'm not. Okay? Uh, if you are, I want you to know that there's a better gospel for you, a better religion. There really is. Uh, give the Bible a chance. If you say you're open-minded and you just follow wherever the Spirit leads, see if the Spirit will lead you to a Bible and read it with an open mind. It also marks the true beginning of winter and was seen as a day of the dead. Now we're going to look at that. We're going to look at that theme 
as we look and take a look at the history of Samhain, or we commonly refer to it as Halloween. Now, that word in itself comes from what I believe to be like the queen of all pagan mystery religions. And that, of course, would be, and I don't mean to be offensive, but that would be Roman Catholicism. I mean, here you have the Bible, God himself telling all of us in the, around the world, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. He didn't say, don't make false gods. He said, don't make any graven images. Don't pray to them. Don't bow to them. God said, just don't do it because that's not who God is. That's not who Jesus Christ is. The crucifix is not Jesus Christ. He is not still suffering for our sins. He the Bible says he suffered once and for all. And that's what I like about it. But it's basically based on, you know, the Catholics have a day for certain saints. Now, according to Catholic doctrine, only certain people can be called saints if they are approved now, get this, by the Pope, by the Curia, by the Cardinals, I don't know what process it takes or who makes the decision, but it's the high up hierarchy of the Catholic Church. They decided one day that Pope John Paul II was now a saint. He is Saint John Paul II, and according to Vatican rules, church dogma, you can pray to Saint John Paul II, and he will hear your prayers, and he will carry your prayers to Jesus Christ. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says we have one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Actually, the Bible tells us that all true believers in Jesus Christ who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, have been born again, have the forgiveness of sins, and heaven is their everlasting home, all of us who have the true faith of Jesus Christ are the saints. And I certainly don't need you asking me or praying to me, and I'll carry your prayer to Jesus. I mean, I don't mind praying for you. I do every day. But I'm not that kind of saint. You get what I'm saying here? So, the whole thing revolves around November the 1st. November the 1st was called All Saints Day. In other words, you know, St. Mary has this day, and St. John the Baptist has this day. But on November 1st, you can celebrate and pray to all of the Catholics. I have no idea how many. There's got to be thousands of them. All the Catholic saints get celebrated. They get prayed to, have festivals and feasts in their honor. Candles are lit. Uh, masses are said all over the world and so on and so on. And this is not just in the Catholic Church. It is in some of the, some of the mainline denominations. All right? Uh, so it revolves around that idea of the evening before All Saints Day or All Hallows Day, All Holy People Day. So Halloween is Hallows Eve, and it falls on the night of October 31st. And you know now in our culture, in this country, okay, we're like pagan out of the years because every year they start pushing Halloween stuff at Walmart, Costco, Sam's, and all these other major outlets, they start pushing Halloween stuff in July, August. Okay, get it out there on the shelves, people start buying early. Now Christmas stuff is already out. People are already Christmas shopping on Amazon, and you know how it works. Then, every October, all over the country, people have set up these haunted houses. Now, back in my day, when we were, you know, young, we just went trick-or-treating, dressed up as ghosts or, you know, cowboys or whatever. whatever. Whatever costume mom would get at the store or whatever. But now these, I mean, these things are big budget things. These haunted houses, haunted mansions, these ghost tours. I mean, they are huge money. This article came out a couple years ago. 
take a look at what it says. An extreme haunted house requires a 40 page waiver. Critics say it's a torture chamber. Now, as you can see by uh, the two females here in this picture, they are scared out of their mind. Every year, the Nightmares Fear Factory Haunted House in Niagara Falls, Canada releases a selection of photos of its terrified visitors. These are their faces of fear. Now, according to the article, one of the things that the owner of the company who, who runs this thing, one of the things he's good at is hypnotizing people. And I mean really hypnotizing people. Putting them under the power of subliminal suggestion. So the whole event doesn't just deal with, you know, a door opening suddenly and this fake ghost coming out at you and you go, huh, ah, scare me. They're getting into the root of your mind. The article says the, the manor is an interactive experience that relies on mind games meant to make people believe things that aren't really happening. He said people are not really waterboarded, for example, but he uses hypnosis and other mind control techniques to put that thought in their heads. He said if you're good enough and you're able to get inside somebody's noggin like the way that I can, McCamey said, I can make folks believe whatever I want them to believe. And obviously those two ladies believe something very very bad and dangerous is going to happen. Now, if Halloween is described as, as anything, one of the ways that I think we could describe it as the exact opposite of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Let me read you that. Paul said in Galatians 6.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So I don't have to get a permit from the city of Festus to tell people the gospel because it doesn't hurt anybody. It only saves them, okay? So did you see anything in here of the fruit of the Spirit relating to fear, torture, dismemberment, macabre images, devils, witches, ghosts, werewolves, vampires. Did you see anything like that? Jack-o'-lanterns made out of human fat. Did you, you didn't see anything like that in there, did you? No. Because God has a different spirit than this, okay, or that. He has a different spirit. 1 John 4.18 says, There's no fear in love. The perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. 2 Timothy 1.7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Somebody who deals with anxiety, sometimes depression, I get panic attacks, I can tell you, I don't like fear. I don't like dealing with it. I don't like having it. I don't like, I don't like spirits playing around with my mind, trying to make me afraid of things that are not there, or make me afraid of things that they'll do that I know from the Bible they cannot do but I deal with it anyway. And I don't want more fear. I want less. I want that spirit that God said, God said he's not given us the spirit of fear because fear hath torment. And I tell you, I, I deal with people all the time who are afraid. They're afraid of the illnesses in their families, taking their family members from them. They're afraid of losing their jobs. They're afraid they can't pay their bills. They're afraid that their marriage is going to go south. They're afraid something is going to happen to their children. They're afraid that their sins will be found out. And I deal with people like that every day. And I can tell you that fear doesn't belong mixed in with the gentle love, 
beautiful fruits of the Holy Spirit. It, it really just isn't, it isn't Christian. Take a look at this. This is a typical scene in people's yards every year, especially in neighborhoods, a lot of houses, People spend a ton of money outdoing their neighbors. Uh, I've got more junk in my yard. I've got more ghosts, more witches, more skeletons, more webs than you do, more spiders, and so on. People spend a lot of money on costumes now. That's why these stores are opening up all over the country. They start opening up around August. So people can prepare and buy their costumes and get it ready. And I mean, this is a we're talking money in probably the billions of dollars every year spent just on what amounts to, you can disagree with you want. This is your choice. But it's a pagan holiday. And yeah, I used to practice it when I, when I was a child. Went trick-or-treating. In this church when I was a teenager, we, we'd set up haunted rooms. I had the best one, okay? But after you learn the things that you learn, the history of it, which is what we're doing, you decide maybe, maybe this isn't something that I should be doing as a Bible-believing Christian. Maybe it's something I'm going to talk to the Lord about, I'm going to read the Bible, and I'll let the Holy Ghost tell me. That's all I'm asking you to do today. Okay? Uh, here's the scene from, of course, Greenwich Village, New York. A lot of rich people there. Halloween, Halloween parade in Manhattan. Surprised you don't see Michael Jackson there. Of course, he's dead, but you know, hey, Halloween is all about bringing back the dead, right? So maybe we'll bring his spirit back and I, I don't, keep your kids indoors, okay? Now, Jeremiah 10 offers us some pretty good advice here when it comes to how we ought to live our lives. There is a lot of paganism now in this country. It didn't used to be, um, but it's showing up. Uh, from the 60s, um, people started getting high and they started getting in contact with different spirits. Christianity takes a fall in this country and pastors now aren't preaching the gospel. They're not even preaching the Bible half the time anymore. So anytime there is a void of the Word of God, there is going to be something that fills that void. And practically most of it falls under the category of paganism. Whether you start practicing yoga, which is a Hindu pagan practice. They believe, they believe in 330 million gods for crying out loud. And the word yoga means yoke. You are yoking yourselves to them. That's another video. But anyway, here's the advice God offers us when we live in a day that is full of paganism. Jeremiah 10, 2, Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. Now, notice some things in this verse here. It's going to compel us. It's going to propel us forward here. Learn not the way of the heathen. That means these people don't learn their practices, don't learn their ways. Don't. I mean, I do it. It's part of my training so that I know when the sword, I can see the sword coming from the farthest away possible. And I'm telling you, this is a sword, okay? So learn not the way of the heathen. Be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. And October the 31st, All Hallows' Eve, is actually based, and I'm going to show it to you in a little bit, is based on the signs of the heaven. That's why that day was picked in particular. For the heathen are dismayed at them. And God says, I don't, I don't want you to have what they have. I have something far better than that. I have, I have faith. I have love. I have gentleness. I have meekness. I have kindness. Notice that in the fruits of the Spirit, there was nothing in there about God's sharp daggers or Freddy Krueger or anything like that. Okay? So the fruit, what I'm selling to you is the fruit of the Spirit 
and paganism and its practices are not, they don't, they don't belong together in the same place. Leviticus 19.26, remember the signs of the heavens? That deals with the observation of times. That's the way the Bible puts it. Um, you shall, Leviticus 19.26, you shall not eat anything with the blood. Think about that in Halloween. Neither shall you use enchantment, think about that with Halloween, nor observe times. In other words, in Bible Christianity, not, not what the Episcopal Church says, not what the Presbyterian Church says, not what the Lutheran Church says, but in Bible Christianity, is there any one day more holy than the others? In other words, is there a day where it's easier to reach God in prayer or to hear from God by reading his word? Is there a particular day that God has chosen that is better for us to reach him or to be or to hear from him than some other day. Yeah, I know some people are going to say, it's the Sabbath day. Remember what Jesus said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And most people have it backwards, especially the Seventh-day Adventist and the Hebrew Roots people. They worship, they don't worship God, they worship the Sabbath day itself, which is Saturn's day. Let's throw that in. But anyway, the, sa the Sabbath was made for man to have a day of rest, is what it is. And that's how God tells us to observe, remember the Sabbath, to keep it holy, and to work six days, but take the Sabbath day off and rest ourselves. It's God's favor to us by giving us a day off of our labors. So when it comes to, I'm talking about observing times. I'm talking about, is there a day when it's easier to reach God than it is on other days? No. Is there a day or an hour when we're appointed to read the Bible all day as opposed to other days? No. No law, no commandment, no doctrine from scriptures tells us that any one day is different than any other day. But in every, I'm talking every other religion, including paganism, they observe days. Deuteronomy 18.10, There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, Halloween, an observer of times, that's astrology, Halloween, that's other things, or an enchanter, or a witch. Actually, the list goes on. There's nine things in Deuteronomy 18 that God says he doesn't want his people being. And there's nine things in this book, like love, joy, peace, long-suffering, that he tells us that he'll give us for free with his Holy Spirit. Isn't that neat? Nine bad things that God says don't do. And why? God's not mean. He's warning us. Out of love, he's warning us, don't do these things. Because the heathen that you just kicked out of this land, I kicked them out because they were doing these things. And I don't want my people doing it. Why? Because God knows that the spirits behind this are bad, bad jokers. They are evil, unclean spirits. They are devils. They possess people. They are what gets in people that causes them to murder somebody. Yeah, I believe that one. You better believe I do. So God says, don't do these things. They're dangerous. I mean, if you went to a place and heard that, it, you know, it's a great swimming place. You ought to go there. And you go there and there's a big sign there. Big, bold words. Danger. No swimming. I'm not going to ask you what you would do, because some people would go, hey, this looks like a good place, there's nobody here. But somebody's trying to tell you, don't swim here, it's dangerous. You don't know why. They're just saying, don't do it. I'm getting older. I wouldn't, maybe in my younger days, but not now, I wouldn't do it, okay? Uh, take a look at this picture. We're going to get into history now. 
of Samhain. And this goes all the way back to the 1830s, this particular picture. Now, the idea of Samhain goes back even further than that, and we'll get into that. But this particular picture here called Snap Apple Night, Snapple? No, just Snap Apple Night, paintings from 1833, shows people feasting, I got this from Wikipedia, people feasting and playing divination games on Halloween in Ireland. Notice they're bobbing for apples and they're drinking, you got people passed out on the floor and um, kids and adults and all sorts of revelry and so on. Now remember, God said in Deuteronomy 18, don't let there be found anyone that useth divination. So here, Ireland, 1833, supposedly a Christian nation, predominantly Catholic, doing exactly what God said don't do. Don't use divination. Divination is receiving information or messages from some or any kind of wisdom through any supernatural means aside from, let's say, um, the written word or the spoken word. Like, you know, cutting a, an apple in half and looking at how the seeds look and say, oh, I can see your future. Or looking at somebody's hand. Palmistry is an example of divination. Oh, this right here, the, the, this is your this line here, and this is your health line here, and these are your four fingers here, and this says that you're going to live to be 57. Let's see, I'm 56 now. That's divination. Okay? That's what that is. And God said, don't do it. There are spirits that are behind this, and God said, don't do it. But that's the history of Samhain or Halloween. It's where all of it came from. There was no act of Congress that established Halloween as a national holiday. It's not. You don't get off work for it. There was no commandment from God that said you had to do this. So where did it? It just popped up. People started practicing it. And they started doing things. The Bible said don't do. Here is 1904. I mean, this doesn't just go back to our childhood. This, we're talking hundreds of years. A greeting card, 19, Hall uh, 1904, Halloween greeting card. And it says, on Halloween, look in the glass. Your future husband's face will pass. Now, you remember, mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? Remember that? That was, uh, anyway. You know what she was doing? She was performing a divination ritual. Here it is on the screen. Called scrying. Sc not crying, scrying. And scrying is done, you look at the picture here, it's either done with a crystal ball or a scrying bowl. Uh, occultist John D. Uh, back about 300 years ago, 400 years ago, something like that. Uh, he had a divination bowl and um, they fill it with mercury or water, uh, anything reflective like that, and you gaze into it or a mirror, polished brass or polished silver or anything like that, that'll reflect, and you gaze into it, and then after a while, you start seeing a spirit in there. Uh, and, do I, oh, you don't believe that? Yeah. It's divination. God said, don't do it, and it, the reason why he said don't do it is there are devils behind this. You, you're actually going to get what you think you want, but I'm telling you, when you get it, you won't want it. You won't want what comes after it, okay? Because once devils take control, they're hard. It's like having bed bugs. Once you get them in your house, pretty hard to get them out. Okay. But anyway, this is the, the history of this. Now watch this. We've talked about observing times, um, 
rituals done on certain days. We'll get more into that. And the fact that God said, don't do the way of the heathen, don't follow their ways or learn their ways, because they are dismayed at the signs of heaven. That is observing times. And God said, don't do it. That was in the Old Testament. Now, some people will use the argument, well, that was in the Old Testament. We don't, we're not under the Old Testament. We follow the New Testament. Okay, I got you on that one. Galatians 4, how's that? Galatians 4, this is the Apostle Paul telling us basically the same thing. Watch this. How be it then, when ye knew not God, this is before you supposedly got saved or started going to church, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now, after that you have known God, the God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements. Think about that. Now focus on that word, okay? Or just remember the word elements because we're going to see it again. And we're going to see what he's talking about here in a minute. Whereunto you desire again to be in bondage. You, and this is what he's referring to. You observe days and months and times and years. Four things. And there's four gospels. So we'll put four here on the pagan side, four here on the gospel side. Okay? Score is tied. And God said, follow this, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but stay away from this. Okay? You observe days, months, times, and years. You follow after these ritual calendars that tell you that on certain days, certain powers can be attained or certain graces can be given to you from a god or the gods or the force or Gaia or the horned god or whatever god or spirit or universal cosmic intellect that you follow that on certain days you're going to get something from them where you wouldn't get it other days. And history is full of that kind of belief. It's a supernatural, it's a superstitious belief is what it is. The belief that, oh, on this day we have to do this, we have to turn our chairs around backwards, you know, away from the table, or we have to turn a plate upside down, or we have to set a, this is actually done, we have to set a plate for old Uncle Howard, he died about five years ago, and every day uh, this time of year, we set a plate for him, and we invite him to come back for dinner with us. Let me tell you something from the Bible. Uncle Howard's not coming back to dinner anytime soon or anytime at all. That's what the Bible says. Now, he mentions the weak and beggarly elements. And remember, here I'm trying to tell you that the reason why God didn't want us, or anybody else for that matter, following after these practices, witchcraft, wizardry, sorcery, enchantments, divination, all of that. So the reason why God, because he knew there was devils appointed to that. Those are like gateways and doorways for devils, gods with a little g, um, evil spirits, familiar spirits, ghosts, poltergeists, things you don't want in your house, okay? They're doorways where these things, you basically, you open the door and you let them in. And he calls them weak and beggarly elements. Beggarly. When I, I used to play in the woods all the time as a kid growing up. I knew the woods behind our house. I knew them. I could walk blind through them. And by the time I came back, it looked like I did because I'd have these little things stuck to my britches pants. And mom, I said, mom, what are these? She said, son, you got beggar lice all over you. Now, they, it wasn't lice. It was these little sticky seeds that as I walked through the woods, usually in the fall and the winter, they basically move themselves around and plant themselves by sticking to deer fur or rabbit fur or anything that walked by my britches legs and 
then they fall off someplace else and that's where they're going to be planted next year and so on. So basically you've got weak and beggarly elements, spirits, that are hitchhiking along with you and you think, you practice witchcraft, and you think that you're getting power and that you're getting things from which that was the magic power of witchcraft ad that I've talked about before that I saw in comic books when I was a kid and boy I wanted that because man it promised money and you could get girls to love you and all this stuff but the truth of it is you're not getting from them near as much as what they're taking from you actually they're spoiling you and that doesn't mean giving you everything you want you know when something spoils in the refrigerator it's because something else took over what you had in the refrigerator some bacteria some sort of mold got in there grew in that dark cold environment like a cave and started consuming and eating and releasing acid and toxins into your food and you have to throw it out. That's what spoilage is. They're stealing things from us. Sounds like governments, doesn't it? Weak and beggarly elements. And God said, you know, before you followed God, you didn't have anything, you know, you did this stuff all the time. But now, supposedly, you're on a track of knowing who God is, God knows you and you believe he's called you to live a life of faith but now you're turning back to the same old stupid stuff that you used to do before you became a Christian or before you started going to church and Paul said why are you doing this why do you why after being set free do you desire to be in bondage again because that's what it is now I mentioned the word elements okay he uses it here, and he mentions you observe days, months, times, and years. And believe it or not, that's actually part of it. One, two, three, four. There's four things here. And have you ever heard of the four elements? Earth, air, fire, water. Now, I remember maybe fourth grade, my teacher, my fourth grade teacher um, used to say I can remember her talking about the four elements in our history book and how the ancient Greeks were superstitious and they didn't have the science knowledge that we have now and they thought that everything in the universe was made out of four basic elements sort of like the periodic table only now we have like what is 110 108 elements that we know of um, been a long time since I looked at the periodic table. But anyway, back in the days that they only believed in four, earth, everything was made of one or more of these things, earth, air, fire, and water. Well, that's only partially true because the real meaning behind earth, air, fire, and water has more to do with this and this than it does what the Greeks believed back 3,000 years ago. Look up, just go to Google, Yahoo, DuckDuckGo, Wikipedia, look up elemental witchcraft, elemental Wicca, elemental practices. Look that up, okay? Just browse through the articles. You'll find that it's all 100% related to pagan rituals and the practice of witchcraft and we'll throw in a little Satanism too. Take a look at this, The Path of Elemental Witchcraft, a word woman's book of shadows. Okay, And notice the four elements. You have green for the earth, blue for the water, uh, like clouds or sometimes they'll have um, like a yellowish color for the, you know, for, for air and then of course, you know, the fire. You recognize that. So that's a book. Notice the pentagram on the top of it, just like this one. And then over here on the right, this is actually called the witch's wheel of the year. And for every element, earth, air, fire, and water, 
Well, looky here, they have a season. Winter, spring, summer, and autumn. Just like in Galatians, you observe days, months, times, and years. Here, along with the elements, earth, air, fire, and water, you have winter, spring, summer, and autumn. And four more things that are associated with it called the four cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. Because, seriously, because people actually believe that facing in certain directions matters when it comes to receiving blessings from the gods or the spirits or when it comes to releasing your power as a witch or a Wiccan or a wizard you must face in these directions or whatever all throughout Kenya I kept noticing pointing out to my fellow preachers there the Muslim mosques were not lined up along the roads like all the other buildings and houses and little hotels and little shops were they were all lined up with the street but not the Muslim mosques they were all facing a certain direction toward Mecca so that when you went in the entrance to the mosque it was easy to get, lay your carpet down and get down and pray five times a day to Allah because Allah is such a I don't know a weak God that he can only hear you if you're looking right at him while he's at Mecca or wherever. Apparently that's what they believe, that you must face a certain direction. Witches practice this. I've seen, I've seen Beth Moore do it. Okay? You don't believe me, but I've seen her do it. Have everybody in the church stand up, have some people face north, south, east, and west, and we're all going to call out to God at the same time. Why? Why can't we just pray and call upon the name of the Lord? We don't have to do that. And she doesn't need to be up behind the pulpit either. That's a different witchcraft. Anyway, um, so you get where I'm going with this, is that these four high holy days that they practice, the winter solstice, the spring equinox, the summer solstice, the autumnal equinox, these four days are high holy days for witches, witches, Wiccans, wizards, pagans, Satanists, you name it. They all have their little rituals that they do on these days, okay? They're observing times. They're going along with the weak and beggarly elements. Here is the book, The Complete Idiot's Guide <clears throat> to Wicca and Witchcraft. And now I'm going to make the connection for you of the idea that these elements of earth, air, fire, and water and the what they call the witches' sabbaths, um, summer solstice, autumn equinox, winter solstice, spring equinox, and we'll get into the cross quarter days too here in a minute because Samhain is one of those. That on these particular days they, they worship and they call to different forces. Okay? And the forces that they call unto, there's four of them. It's starting to ring a bell? We'll get there. And the witches call them watchtowers. And let's read what the Complete Idiot's Guide to Wiccan Witchcraft says about these watchtowers that are related to the four elements. There is one watchtower for each of the four directions. Sometimes the watchtowers are referred to as the guardians of the watchtowers. Various authors have come up with different theories to explain who the watchtowers are. Some people see them as the stars of heaven. Raven Grimasi, a popular Wiccan author, has described them as ancient people of earth that the gods put here to watch over us. In a, that means dead people. People that used to live and are dead now, and they've been brought back to life and they watch over us. Okay? Hang on to that. Um, in a lot of ways, you can think of the watchtowers as the bouncers in the bar. They're big. They're tough. And you don't want them to mess with you. If you want the watchtower's presence, you stir them. 
like the ancient ones, the watchtowers are sleeping. You might want the watchtowers to be present to watch over you if you're doing a dedication or an initiation ceremony. Now notice what she says here. Dragons. There are five dragons. Fire, air, earth, water, and spirit. The dragons come from a long line of truly awesome, noble creatures. Well, we know what they are, don't we? According to Scripture, Genesis 3, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. Revelation 12, There appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And then it says in verse 9, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Now that's some kind of mighty power that that dragon has. That he is so big and bad and mean and rough and he's the bouncer. But he lost the war in heaven. He got kicked out. He, the bouncer got kicked out. That's what we're saying here. The bouncer got kicked out. And the third of the angels along with him. He lost the war. He lost the war at Calvary. When Christ died on the cross, defeating all of our enemies that are against us. It's like Samson. How did Samson's life end? In heroic warfare fashion. He didn't commit suicide. I've heard people say that. Well, Samson committed suicide. No, he didn't. He saved a nation by destroying their enemies. The Bible says that he killed more enemies in his death than he did in his life. It's a type of Christ. It's a picture of Jesus Christ on the cross taking all the things, all of these things that are against us and nailing them to his cross so that when he dies, they go with him. Isn't that neat? Wouldn't that make an awesome movie? Actually, we have the Bible. It's better. But now you understand that these elements are not just gasps of air and a fire and a bowl of water and, let's see, and, and, a, and a plate of dirt. They're more than that. They're spirits. Four of them. Four types of them. Know where I'm going now? Ephesians 6, 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against, number one, principalities. There's a dragon for you. Number two, against powers. There's a dragon. Number three, rulers of the darkness of this world. Number four, against spiritual spirits. Spiritual wickedness in high places. And why would a church name itself Element Church and put as its logo earth, see the little sun there above the E, air, fire, and water. Actually, this is not just a one-off thing. This is not just some curious thing that I just happened to stumble over on the Internet. Look it up. Just type in Element Church. There's hundreds, if not thousands, of them now. All, all renaming themselves. They used to be First United Methodist Church, First Baptist Church. First Church of the Nazarene. That's what they used to be called. But now denominations are bad. They're, they're, they're bad for business. So we're going to cut out the denominational name and forget about doctrine. Doctrine's bad. It's about love. Okay? So let's forget the Bible. Let's forget doctrine. Let's just love each other the way God loves us. And let's not distinct our, or distinguish ourselves, distinct ourselves. Let's, let's not distinguish ourselves and set ourselves apart like God says 
but let's be like everybody else. So you can't tell what, what it is that we are. You don't know if we're Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, United Church of Christ. You don't, you don't know anything. Okay? And we're just the elements church. And I've seen a actual churches call element church and their subtitle is infuse the elements. Which means bring them into you. Are you kidding me? We just found out from the Wiccan source, from the Wiccan viewpoint, that the four elements are four evil spirits. And then you have churches saying, if you put them in you, where is the discernment? Why doesn't anybody ever read their Bible anymore? That's what I'm wondering. Well, I mean, I think I know why. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. So, we have earth, air, fire, and water. And I mentioned the vernal equinox, which is the spring equinox, summer solstice, autumnal equinox, winter solstice. So, again, we're back with what Paul said in Galatians. You observe days, months, times, and years. In fact, when were the... He mentioned the heavens. They, you know, they're observing the heavens, the signs in the heavens. When were they created? What day? Day four. And he said that the sun and the moon and the stars, he said, let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And yes, we use the sun, the moon, and the stars to measure time, both minutes, seconds, hours, days, weeks, months, years. We use the heavenly bodies as a clock exactly the way God gave them to us for. And for signs and for seasons. We have certain seasons, fall, winter, spring, summer, that just occur around these certain days. My dad, bless his heart, was a genius at knowing the signs when to plant his gardens and he got a farmer's almanac every year he knew when to plant he knew um, when things should be ripe he knew when crappie would be um, spawning and he knew where they were and he'd call me and say son the crappie are spawning next Tuesday down at Lake Kincaid you wanna go down there yeah I'll take you down there and we just pull in fish like crazy so, yeah, they were given to us as a gift, but now these things have been turned into the weak and beggarly elements. It's like in, um, here, a flash coming in from heaven, the book of Romans, chapter 1, because that, verse 21, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. And they changed the first 23. They changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man. Count this. And to birds and to four-footed beasts and creeping things. Paganism. Now we get into the cross quarter days. You have, you have them looking like this. Uh, winter, summer, spring, fall. And then we do this. And we have four Gaelic terms, and I'm probably not going to get them right, but let's, let's give it a whirl here. Number one, Beltane, which is, you look on the wheel of time here, down at the bottom, it's May 1st, May Day. Lunasad, maybe I pronounced that right, and we find that over here, August 1st. Samhain, Mr. Sam Hain himself, it has up here at the top, November 1st, but it actually starts the night before, October 31st, and in bulk, February the 2nd, 33rd day of the year, February 2nd. Think they're not counting observing days there? They are. And see, the thing about Samhain, Halloween, is like I said, it's observing times. You have the uh, winter solstice, and you have the you have the fall equinox and the winter solstice, okay? And in the middle of those two days, um, 
fall equinox and winter solstice, right in the middle there, you have Samhain, Halloween, cross quarter days. So it's actually four days that they call Sabbath, and then four more days stuck in the middle of those other four days, a total of eight. Okay? And here's what Wikipedia says about Samhain. This is the history of it. Samhain is a Gaelic festival marking the end of the harvest season and the beginning of winter or the darker half of the year. Traditionally, it is celebrated from October 31st to 1st of November as the Celtic day began and ended at sunset. This is about halfway between the autumn equinox and the winter solstice. I think I just said that. It is one of the four Gaelic seasonal festivals along with Imbolc, Beltane, and Lunasad. Historically, it was widely observed throughout Ireland, Scotland, and the Isle of Man. Similar festivals are held at the same time of year in other Celtic lands, for example, the Britannic Caelan Gape in Wales, Caelan Gwab in Cornwall, and Caelan Gonv in Brittany. Both Celtic branches are roughly as old as each other. So, what is it? Is Halloween part of the true religion of loving the Lord God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind? Is it part of the nine fruits of the Spirit? Is it part of the gifts of God that He gives to mankind upon salvation when He fills us with His Spirit? And all of a sudden now we just love people and we care about one another and we love the Lord our God with all our heart and we love our neighbor as ourselves and we don't want to hurt anybody. We certainly don't want to kill anybody. We certainly don't want evil spirits and dragons and serpents and all kinds of creepy things in our houses, in our families, in our churches, in our country. We don't want those things. What we want is the Holy Spirit of God, a clean spirit. David said, after his sin with Bathsheba, Psalm 51, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Uh, take not thine Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. You hear that word joy? That's one of the nine fruits of the Spirit. But instead, we're going to dress our children up as blood-sucking, which God said, you're not supposed to do blood-sucking vampires, witches. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, God said. Dragons. Dragons are big now. All the, you know, how to tame your dragon, right? We're going to do that. We're going to spend $500, $600 decorating our house, our front yard, so our neighbors go, ooh, ah, look at them, and they got to outdo us next year, and that's what we're going to do. And you have to, I'm, I'm leaving it up to you. I'm not done. I got, we got trick-or-treating to do. Or, excuse me, mumming and guising. We'll deal with that. But these are things God specifically said don't do them. Stay away from them. Why? Because God loves us and he knows the harm and the danger that lies with these rituals and these days. He knows that because he created all of these evil, terrible creatures. Why? To drive us to the cross. Okay? It's Satan, that evil Satan arrogant enough to start a war in heaven thinking he could sit in the seat of God who tempted us and tricked us into our first sin whatever it was whether it was lying, cheating cursing getting into dad's liquor nowadays it's getting into mom's crack pipe getting on dad's internet, 
Okay? It's the devil that did it. It's the devil that was in that man when he did that stuff to you. That was the devil. You can worship him and celebrate him or... I'm not trying to be mean, but... You can advertise for him if you want. I'm not going to do that anymore. I haven't done it in years. Yeah, I made mistakes. And I regret them. But I'm not perfect. Nobody is. That's why we need a Savior. That's why we need a, a loving God who loves us, has mercy on us, doesn't want to see us die, and is not interested in us spending our eternity in hell's flames, in fear and in torment. Remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus? And the rich man, when he opened his eyes, he was in hell. And he saw Abraham afar off. And he said, Father Abraham, send Lazarus. And have him dip his finger in water and cool him on my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But he couldn't get any help. Because once you're there, you're there. God loves you enough that he sent his only begotten son into this world to die in your place, to take your sins upon himself. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Will you do that? Will you do that? I pray that you do. This is Pastor Mike. God bless you. You're the reason why we do what we do. Keep us always in your prayers. Pray for the people of Kenya as we continue to minister and work and labor among those people. I love them. I can't wait to go see them again. If you liked this video, you're watching on YouTube, hit that like button just like that. And if you're not subscribed to our channel, just subscribe to it. I get no money from this, and we don't have anything for sale. I just want you to be notified the next time we come out with another Watchman video broadcast. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.